it's true there are disputes between Chinese mainland and Taiwan. But I also noticed the opinions in Taiwan are actually very divided. There are separatists, they, want, they are seeking independence, but there are also huge amount of patriots or huge amount of people that actually really support the reunification, support uh, the government in Beijing. So what led to Taiwan got so divided? The various um, contradictions that were brewing in Taiwan, and part of it was also the um, the KMT itself mishandling internal contradictions in, um, in Taiwan. And unfortunately, this led to this sort of logic that um, opportunists seized on for their propaganda purposes to say, hey, remember those terrible years of repression by Chiang Kai-shek? Now, where did Chiang Kai-shek come from? He came from the Chinese mainland. And where is the where is the Communist Party of China from? It's also on the Chinese mainland, and you also and then when um, the KMT had this sort of anti-communist uh, and anti-CPC education, then um, it's really easy to paint them as the bad guy, but also appeal to um, the locals by saying, "Hey, remember all all these terrible things that happened at the hands of the KMT?" Well, basically, the Communist Party is just the red version of all of that repression that Chiang Kai-shek carried out. That's legitimately um, a huge, a huge part of the um, the propaganda that's going on. So, um, and then in the 1990s, I said, um, as I said earlier, there was this sort of um, is marked the beginning of a shift in this sort of identity in order to facilitate the the um, the further liberalization of Taiwan's economy and maintain its status as a U.S. client. And um, yeah, here we are today. Um, there's also the reality. I mean, yes, Taiwan is a part of China, but it also has been governed separately from the mainland for 70 years because of these historical reasons and because the P and CPC stands for patience. So it's... um. Mm. But the but the longer but the longer you wait though the problem is you have new newer generations of um of um Taiwanese people who just don't feel that sort of emotional attachment to the mainland especially since um starting at the turn of the century when the DPP was elected for the first time to um the leadership of the Taiwan administration and this was not done in a democratic way by the way this was done in a very top down fashion they started changing the curriculum. And with as far as history goes, they kind of started gradually teaching mainland Chinese history as like kind of foreign history and then separated Taiwan history from that. Whereas in the past, like when my parents were growing up, Taiwan history was a subset of, you know, domestic history, domestic history being all of Chinese history. So from a young age, um, these, these um, this new generation was kind of, just estranged from understand getting a full understanding of you know what it means to be Chinese, what Chinese culture is, what Chinese civilization is, while still fundamentally practicing Chinese culture, but being told in a way that oh you're Taiwanese first before you are Chinese, and you let that go on and on, and then you get you let in all these NGOs that want to um that want to cuz you can't just go in, as an NGO and like as a US foreign policy you can't just go in and and like outright say what your intentions are you have to find justifications and these things unfortunately become the vessels these existing problems become on vessels for um you know these foreign actors to and and domestic um opportunists to um inject their policies into as a sort of packaging to sell to the public western powers like US government were taking advantage of this uh, situation, historical situation uh, in Taiwan and trying to brainwash the, the, the young generation to like, oh, you're different, you're, you're not Chinese, even though everything you do is really Chinese, speaking Chinese, doing Chinese culture, but you're not Chinese. Yes, that's exactly what the United States is doing through the National Endowment for Democracy and they created the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, which works hand in hand with the NED. And a lot of people say to me when I, when I bring up this topic, well, what do the people in Taiwan want? Why don't you respect what they want? And the problem is, is that really what they want? Or is that what 
millions of dollars from the U.S. pumped into uh, the environment there, uh, putting this idea in their head. Ask People have to ask themselves, is this idea serving the best interests of the people living on, on Taiwan? Is it serving their best interests or is it serving Washington's interests at the cost of the people living there in Taiwan? And it's so obvious that it, that that's the case. And uh, Ukraine and Taiwan are not, not comparable. There's so many differences. U Ukraine is a country, Taiwan is not. But the U.S. used the exact same process to irrationally turn people against uh, you know, for Ukraine against Russia, they have so many ties together, and they artificially and irrationally divided divided them. And look at Ukraine today. Look at the the state of everything there. And this is exactly the plan the U.S. has for Taiwan. They do not care about Taiwan. They care about their own interests and advancing them. And they will use Taiwan to do that. And and this is a this is a tragedy. And there's so many people walking into this trap. And the, like the Democratic Progressive Party, surely they know, and they're they're going along with it for their own self interest. So the 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 best interests of the people in Taiwan, I, I clearly see not being served with this this whole new idea, and mm. that's why when you say what do the people in Taiwan want, well, what what do they really know about about the situation and how much has been put into their head by foreign interference. You cannot have self-determination if these ideas are <laughs> coming from across the ocean, uh, mm. from Washington. Mm. Uh, exactly. It's kind of like I... how a lot of times, um, you know, victims of abuse, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's kind of like how oftentimes you find them victims of abuse, so not acting in their self-interest um, for various, for a variety of reasons. And if you can agree that, um. Grooming can happen on an individual um, basis, you know, like um, you have predatory people like taking advantage of oftentimes younger people and kind of brainwashing them into, you know, so they can be taken advantage of. And if you can agree that can happen on an individual level, then you should understand that it can happen on a societal level, especially when you have an empire like the United States with shadowy organizations like the NED and all sorts of other NGOs that go in into these, you know, into other countries and prop up a bunch of these think tanks that influence the policy, uh, influence the public opinion. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what happened in Hong Kong as well. Uh, because like you guys mentioned, all this so-called independent think tanks, uh, NGOs came in, came here, uh, saying that we are here for democracy and freedom, but actually they are changing the textbooks in schools and uh, planting ideas in, among the young generations. And then gradually we realized the young generations of Hong Kong didn't know the history of China. And they thought British, who were the colonizers, are actually their savior. They thought they want some of them were, were chanting like we want to go back to the British rule because that's how we had that's when we had full, real democracy. Well, in reality, British never gave them democracy. So I mean, their thoughts, their understanding about history or everything were totally being polluted by these so-called NGOs and um, and uh, these think tanks. I remember, I know a young guy from Hong Kong and he, he became very patriotic. He really supported uh, Beijing. And then I remember he said, when we grew up, we were always told we are special. Our Hong Kong, we Hong Kongers are so special. But then years after years, like, why are we special? How are we special? They just don't know <laughs> what are we special at? Just being taught we are special, we are Hong Kongers, we are different. But then after he came to the other parts of China to study and work and live here, he realized, wow, like we are not that special. Actually, the mainland on so many levels uh, developed so much faster than Hong Kong. But I mean, that's I mean that's the the thing these so-called NGOs and think tanks do to the young generations. And do you think that's I think from what you said, Xiang Yu, similar things have ha happened in. Taiwan. Go ahead, Xiang Yu. Uh, it's a very similar things. And you see um, the DPP is becoming even more um, emboldened recently. I mean, you see, you know, the shutdown of the of the news of the news channel, CTI, Zhongtian. 
Mm. Yeah, like they got their um broadcasting license revoked, and um now Minshi like FTV, it's being it's basically controlled by the DPP, and then you see um the Tsai Ing-wen administration, um forming all sorts of partnerships with you know YouTubers like and saw all sorts of internet influencers to give the appearance that these sorts of ideas are coming from the grassroots when in reality these content creators end up being groomed by like the handlers to spread a very specific message so then you have um there are opposition voices but then they're made out but then because they're outside of that very huge echo chamber the um their impacts are sort of diminishing people are getting ostracized for for um in many social circles for holding on to different beliefs and you also see the passage of things like the Anti-Infiltration Act, which on the surface is just, okay, we don't want um, we don't want CPC um like agents or whatever influencing the um the administration. But it was passed so um just it was so rushed, just 34 days. So ironically, the very um the DPP was born from its struggle against um uh the KMT's former um dictatorship and fought for this sort of the liberal democracy that exists in Taiwan today. But that very same liberal democracy that the um that the previous generation of um, DPP people fought for is quickly being eroded away by the current generation of um DPP leaders. I think that's I think that's ironic that that they're claiming to be a democracy. Uh they're you know they're violating people's rights. There is no freedom of speech. Uh, and they're talking about infiltration by, by the CPC when they are completely infiltrated by the United States from all the way across the, the ocean. And, and a nation with a demonstrated track record of destroying and burying entire nations. And uh, this, is, this is what they're doing to China through Taiwan. And, it, and, and you were mentioning uh, grooming. I think, I think that is very accurate. And they're doing it to young people. All of these movements, not just in Taiwan and Hong Kong, but all of these movements here in Thailand, neighboring Myanmar, Malaysia, the whole Milk Tea Alliance, this is a youth movement. They are preying on children and they, they're doing it at younger and younger ages. They, they were in the universities, now they're in the high schools. US, US government funded programs, the uh, YSEALI, the Young Southeast Asia Leadership Initiative. This is the same type of program. They're doing this in, in Taiwan, they're doing this in Southeast Asia. And again, it is a U.S. program serving U.S. interests at the expense of the people participating. And they're trying to form this united front against China, which when you look at the region, China is rising. The region is rising with it. And the United States is sabotaging it mm. all while saying China is the problem and attacking and destroying China is the solution. When in reality, that's just going to subjugate and subordinate the entire region back under U.S. and Western uh, mm. modern day colonialism. I do ask um, my friends in Taiwan how um, they can be supportive of these sorts of things and not and not question U.S. influence in Taiwan, while at the same time being um, opposed to Chiang Kai-shek. I don't know if um, your viewers know this, but nowadays it's some um, these pro-separatist Taiwanese liberals who hate Chiang Kai-shek more than Chinese mainlanders do, because from the Chinese mainland perspective, he was just he was ultimately a loser. And he's been dead for a very long time. There's no reason to really hate him that much. And in the grand scheme of things, he was a Chinese patriot in his own way. I would say, like, mm. is that that was probably what the popular opinion on the Chinese mainland is, right? He like even him doesn't support like Taiwan independence. He's like, oh, we are all China. Like even though he Chiang Kai Shek doesn't didn't like uh, the CPC. But he never won a separated China. It's so like, so I mean, but many people don't know this fact, and they just use like Chiang Kai Shek as the cause of the Taiwan independence. Like, I would say though, in an, in a weird way, in an ironic mm -hmm. way, he was he was um, staunchly against Taiwan separatism, but because of um, the way his leadership um, played out, panned out in Taiwan, and because of some of its problems, he inadvertently sowed some of the seeds for later the liberal opposition and the independence movement to grow, unfortunately.